few things I need to point out. This event, in part, is funded by the Colorado Department of Higher Education through a grant around open educational resources. It's kind of self-serving to point that out because all three of us serve on the Open Education Resources Council for CDHE, but it should be said regardless. Um, so the reason we're recording this is because next week across the United States is Open Access Week. And there's going to be a whole bunch of different events, and if you want to see some other talks, some other things, I can give you links to those, but we're kind of at the front end of next week, so we're going to record this today, and then share it out through the, the Colorado Department of Higher Education as we go um, next week during Open Access Week. Um, open so Education Week. Man. Open Education Week. I always say Access, I'm sorry. <laughs> open <laughs> Education Week. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I will get out of the way and I will turn the time over to our two presenters who you've all started to meet. One is Dr. Emily Reagan, who is a biochemist from Metropolitan State University, Denver here. And Dr. Jonathan Poritz, who is a mathematician, what do you call yourself, a professor of mathematics? There we go. Okay, and so complicated. <laughs> I made that more complicated than it needed to be. And, uh, Colorado State University Pueblo. They're two people who have been very engaged with open education for a long time, and I'm very excited to have their perspectives. Because I've spoken to many of you about this topic, and these people know much more than I do, so you, it won't shouldn't shed off your back so easily as it does when I'm saying things. So I'll just go ahead and turn the time over to these two great people. Well, thank you. This is really exciting to get to be here. Like I mentioned earlier, Jonathan and I will primarily be sharing our stories um, and our journey into open education, but we welcome your questions and comments at any time to make this somewhat interactive. So I really wanted to um, unpack how I got down this rabbit hole and um, got really sucked into open educational resources. And it started actually with me attending a session at a teaching with Technology Symposium on my campus. And Chef Jackson Lamb had a session on how to teach a course online that you didn't think could be taught online. And in his case, it was a, a cooking type class or a culinary arts class. And I got really excited. I said, I could teach Gen Chem 1 online. And so I talked with the instructional designer who had worked with Chef Lamb, and he was really excited. He's like, yes, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be so cool. So I started working with the instructional design team to develop an online class. And when I started thinking about course development, I started to think about the challenges that we face as instructors. And I probably could have had you brainstorm a list of challenges that you think we face. But in many of our courses, we need to cover a lot of content, and we really want to do so rigorously. So this is definitely true in general chemistry. Do you feel like this is true in the field that you teach? Some, some folks agree with this. So we want students to do lots of things. We want them to learn concepts. Especially, I know in uh, math and science classes, we want them to solve problems. Maybe in other classes, we want them to think creatively or think critically, support, um, support things with evidence. And we also ultimately want students to be building a body of knowledge, learning things in introductory classes, retaining key pieces of that knowledge and being able to use those and expand on them in future courses. And then at least in chemistry and probably math, we want students to stop being scared and actually enjoy our field and get over some of the anxiety and trepidation that we have, or they may have at the beginning. So then the question is, how do our resources help us address these and the other challenges that we face? So when we think about our textbooks or other learning materials that we use. And I just pulled out a picture from a general chemistry textbook. How do our resources help us with our course goals and even individual learning objectives? Yeah. Well, obviously give us some visuals to kind of get us the image. OK, so visual representations of the information providing the content, whether it's in text or mm -hmm. visually. So a, a content delivery mechanism. Yeah. I think really high quality resources uh, remove us from, say, from the stage mentality. <coughs> right? So if we have opportunities for diverse learning experiences, our students are obviously going to be more engaged than us just standing in the room. 
Yes, so helping us move away from just being a sage on the stage instructor and think of creative ways to engage our students in the learning process. Um, so certainly we want students to engage with content. We want to, them to engage with content in the classroom. We want them to engage with content during hours outside the classroom, right? They're gonna be most successful in our courses if we're utilizing not just in-class time, but many hours spread out throughout the week for the students. And we want to make connections to prior knowledge so that we can build that framework that really distinguishes novices in the field with experts, with our rich connections between different pieces. Um, and then we also want students to practice, whether it's working problems or practice recalling information that's important to our field. And so I threw up some uh, end of chapter problems, again, out of chemistry, just because that's what I do. But that's something that our textbooks provide us or we might use other resources like online homework systems, right? We want our students working problems or completing assignments so that they can engage with the content and do something with it. So our resources provide us opportunities for students to make those engagements, right? So if we want to start, um, I don't know, really thinking in an interesting way about resources and our teaching and the courses that we create, there might be some things that are important to us that aren't baked in to the textbooks or other resources that we're using. And this is the part that for me is kind of fun. Like how does learning actually work? What, can, what structures can we set up to help learning be effective? And there's this great book that came out in 2014 called Make It Stick. Are any of you familiar with this book? I really love it because it's a review of really the cognitive psychology literature about how learning works. So for any of us who are not in psychology and not already familiar with this body of work, it's nice to have it kind of um, synthesized for us. And I would recommend if you, just, if you get excited about this and want to check this resource out, the very last chapter kind of summarizes the whole book. It might be a good place to start and then go back and read through. But here are some lessons that I got from reading this book that's related to how learning works or how the science of successful learning. So it's really important that students practice retrieval. So for example, self-quizzing or legitimately taking an old exam and pretending to take it, practicing that retrieval, um, and then going back and learning what did I remember well and what did I not. Um, which leads me actually from practicing retrieval into reflection. What is working well for me in studying for this class or in learning and what, what isn't working well? So a really common strategy that students might use is to just read a textbook and then highlight passages. And simply reading and rereading a textbook and highlighting is a notoriously poor way to study, actually. Um, th some of these researchers found that that <laughs> doesn't work very effectively, whereas practicing quizzing uh, is much, a much more effective use of time. Also, and this is helpful for me in chemistry, realizing that it's helping students learn that it can be actually helpful to try to generate a, an answer to a question on their own before they've been shown, even if they're not totally successful in that, that practice in trying to generate the answer actually is beneficial for long-term learning and spaced repetition. So this is why we don't just cram the night before the exam, right? We need to space that learning out to really learn it well and then be able to retrieve it in the future. So this is really exciting to me. And then I'm starting to think, how can I structure my class to include these elements? Is this already baked into the resources that we're using or not? You know, maybe sometimes yes and sometimes no. When we start thinking about open educational resources, we're talking about maybe moving away from a traditional textbook and just following the textbook and trying to think a little bit more creatively about the resources that we use. Or if we do just adopt an OER textbook, we can still take this course redesign time as an opportunity to think about if there's other elements we wanna build into our class that will make it a kind of richer, more exciting experience for our students. So, so how do you start a big course redesign? And when I worked with my instructional design team, our process was to focus on the learning objectives first and then resources second. And for me, this was a paradigm shift because in the past, it was like, what, what book am I using for the course? And of course, there's learning objectives embedded in that. But really, at, at my institution, and I assume it's the same here, what we decide for the course are the course learning objectives. And then we might develop more fine-grained learning objectives for like every single class period. 
And that's, that's different than the resource that we use to help the students meet those learning objectives. And I found it really helpful to decouple those and to focus on clarifying my learning objectives. And then I can identify, are there resources that will help me meet those learning objectives? So again, for general chemistry, Actually, it was at the very end of my course redesign that OpenStax Chemistry came out with a textbook, and I plugged that in at the end. But I had the experience of developing a course without the textbook scaffold for most of the process, and that was really exciting for me. There's FET simulations that if you're in science or math fields, these are um, simulations that the students can interact with, like this molecule rotates around in three-dimensional space, they can change which molecule they're looking at. So all sorts of cool resources that are available out there for us to use. And when we're thinking at the learning objective level, it becomes a little bit more obvious how we might be able to slot some of these other resources into our teaching. Um, and I just threw up LibreText up there because that's another source, especially in chemistry, but there's open educational resources in the form of textbooks available there. And they're trying to expand to other disciplines too. So when we think about open educational resources, it might be something that looks completely like a traditional textbook. It might be something that are standalone simulations. What they have in common is they've been licensed under a Creative Commons license, and so they're free to use, they're free to reuse, and they're actually available for modification. So I could take a segment of the OpenStax book and modify a chapter and share that with my students. And as long as I'm attributing it properly, I'm allowed to do that, which is really different than traditional commercial materials. So I want to tell you my chronological approach to developing that online general chemistry class, just because that was my <laughs> gateway slide into open educational resources. So I did learning objectives first, and that actually took a lot of time, and that took a lot of thinking about the organization of the class. It, it was a little harder than I expected that to be, but it was also very rich because I was thinking very carefully and very in depth about my class. And so then I found, fun things to go with the learning objectives, like some TED-Ed um, videos, which are licensed for use. They're not allowed to be changed, but you can slot those into a class really nicely, too. Um, and then I wrote a lot of my own content in, and put it into our learning management system, Blackboard, because I didn't have the book at that point in time. Um, and so, you know, I set up the organization in my class, how is it going to be structured, areas of inquiry, which are kind of like big chapters, and then explorations, like sub-chapters. So that was kind of fun. And then I got to think about my assessment, right? In chemistry, I think it's very important for students to practice problems. I didn't want them to have to buy anything extra for the class. So I ended up writing questions for all of my learning <laughs> objectives and putting them into Blackboard, putting them into our learning management system. And I'm gonna show you some student feedback related to that here shortly. So we'll talk more about the pluses and minuses of this DIY online homework system shortly. Um, and then, so that was my first three steps. Oops, sorry. Um, what else did I do? So finally, I integrated that OpenStax chemistry book that came out, and that's an awesome supplement. So they get to hear it from me, they also get to read it in a peer-reviewed multiple author source. It's good to have multiple sources of information. I also, because this was an entirely online class, I recorded a bunch of videos where you can hear me talking, see me working through problems, and students like that, for, especially for an online class. And then I plugged those FET simulations in there, and the students do discussion posts around them. And I will tell you, this is the one thing in my online class I feel like works a lot better than in my face-to-face -face class, is I can incorporate these, these videos or these simulations better. So what did students think about this new online class that's entirely OER? So I've administered a survey also through our learning management system. Um, and I, I wanted to show just a few questions that I thought were interesting. So one was, um, so these are all these Likert scales from strongly agree in the darkest orange to strongly disagree in the black. And this first question is, I prefer online to print materials. That's not true of a majority of students. It's like 45% of students taking an online class agreed that they preferred online to print materials. So that means, well, a big chunk of my students really didn't have a strong opinion either way, and it was less than 20% who disagreed. Now, this is a segment of students who signed up for an entirely online class. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting to me that it's not like there's a huge preference for online materials. Um, 
But when we start talking about either reading material from a free online textbook, now 60% of students agree that they like it when it's free, <laughs> even if it's online. And this question was, I prefer free online access rather than a traditional textbook. And now I'm at 75% of my students agreeing with that. So that's just kind of interesting. Now I do want to point out that open educational resources do not mean online resources. With OpenStax, students can download a PDF and they can print the portions they want, or you can buy a hardbound book that's shiny and beautiful. It is still kind of expensive. It's like, I don't know, $70 for this hardback book, but that's way less than the 200 some dollars that our new textbook cost before. So again, not all students choose to buy the physical book, but that option is there. There's a range of options, there's a range of formats that are available, and students can actually take advantage of both the online formats and you know, printing the portions they want, or if they really want that physical book, at least with OpenStax, there's an easy way to access that. So, okay, so it's just, this is an interesting question. Do students learn well with online materials or not? I think that is a question that some people will debate about. But I wanna be clear that open educational resources are not required to be online, it's just, when you print them, you're printing them more at your own cost rather than having to pay a bunch of royalties on top of the, the cost of printing. Okay, another um, course design question. Did the course materials help me achieve the learning objectives? And about 85% of the students agreed, and I was happy it was just a small segment of students disagreeing um, with that. <laughs> like this was uh, more positive than some of those other questions I'd asked. I have a few comments from students. They liked the videos, and some students really enjoyed having a variety of different modalities to engage with the content. Um, okay, so a do-it-yourself online homework system. How did this work? So I will be honest, this, oh, I'm at disadvantage. Okay, let's start with the advantages. <laughs> well, I really, no, okay, I can't help myself. It took a lot of time, you guys. I can't <laughs> lie. It took a lot of time, and it requires troubleshooting. For example, Blackboard has a sig fig glitch that I didn't realize was a glitch until I started having problems with it. I'm still a little annoyed about that. I figured out a workaround, but there is you know, some level of troubleshooting on my end. Although now I can share this with other faculty. Like, what learning management system do you guys have? We're moving to Canvas. You're moving to Canvas, that's exciting. Okay, good for you. So Canvas makes it easy for faculty to share across institutions. There's a Canvas Commons for questions. So there's some exciting possibilities in your future there. Um, giving adequate feedback isn't impossible, but it is kind of hard. Um, and there's other online homework strategies like web work that would make giving very individualized feedback, I think, more possible. But I just took what was available to me and used it. But what- that a lot of your disadvantages have been minimized since you were doing this. Yes, now, yeah, keep in mind that I did this about five years ago, right? So this is a moving, but after I put that work in to keep it going has not been bad. And I'll tell you, I love the alignment that I have in this class, because it's my learning objectives that I already selected that are being tested, both in the practice activities, which function like homework, and the quizzes and the exams. Like, I'm emphasizing what I'm actually wanting to teach. I've used online homework systems before, and it can be a pain to scroll through those questions and try to find the ones that match what you're doing. And sometimes you think you found something that matched, and it has a twist that you didn't really want to have in, you know. So, okay, I like the alignment. I love that there's no additional cost to students, there's no additional system to navigate. Okay, so this is just one thing that I did. And I'll tell you, I liked it so much that I did this in my biochemistry classes too, actually a smaller version, because they're face-to-face -face classes, but I used to give quizzes in class, I've moved them online, because actually it's not a terrible amount of work. Okay. So what do students think about this DIY online homework system? And maybe I should have said the practice activities, they can just take over and over again, unlimited attempts. The exit quizzes, they just get to do once. The ex other exams just get to do once. So uh, over 80% of the students say the course assessments measure what they learned, and slightly more say that they measure what was presented in the course materials. I feel like this, I don't have pre-data, but because this is really mapped to my learning objectives, I would certainly hope that these numbers would be pretty high. Um, so some students really liked the practice activities. I chose, and this is my choice, not to ultimately give them the correct answer, and they don't like that. 
Um, I could change the settings and, and do that differently, though. That's, again, that's a, a choice that you're making when you're using these online homework systems. Some people feel like the quizzes, if the question isn't worded exactly the same way, it's throwing them off. But actually, as a chemistry faculty member, I'm doing that on purpose. I want them to learn problem solving. But I just, I thought that was a cute comment. You either know it or you don't. I've had some don'ts. Yeah, sometimes that happens. Um, OK. Yeah, please. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So there's two ways to give the students individual quizzes, so they're not all just getting the same quiz and, you know, Susie and Johnny sit down right next to each other and just take the same quiz. So there's two ways that happens. One is there's calculated formula questions where there's different numbers that are going to pop in in a certain spot. That works really well in chemistry. And then the other strategy is you can make a whole pool of questions, and the students will get one of this set of questions. Of course, in that case, you have to write more questions so you can have a bigger pool. Um, but that's absolutely something that I've done. And every time they take the, que the, like the homework, they're going to get different questions in different orders, which kind of helps prevent them just memorizing the position. and. Um, you know, trying to use some of those context clues rather than actually learning the content to, to answer the questions. And then my second question is, um, is this a class that is a non-majors chemistry or is it a major? It's for, uh, um, it's for science majors, but not just chemistry majors. Oh. So a certain, uh, if, some, if someone's going to get a BS in biology, they take this class. You know, if someone's maybe a physics major and they're taking chemistry, they would take this class. People who are going into maybe nutrition or certain other tracks take a, a different class. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? But again, this is just one person exploring what's possible, right, with the resources that I have to help me meet my learning goals. Um, so for, this is just for the lecture portion of it? You can yes. Have to, like, we, Yes, so we do not currently offer an online lab. The people enroll for lecture and lab separately, so people are still taking the lab section on campus. We do have some, um, like, the other chemistry class that might be for non-majors, we have sometimes um, offered an online lab for that, and that's just a whole other <laughs> can of worms, honestly, so. Um, so this is, this is my equation that I came up with. So <laughs> we want, and this was based on that Make It Stick book, right? We want students to engage in recall and reflection so they can get to lasting learning. And the resources that we use, the content that we deliver, intersects with that. But we want the students using the content and being able to engage in recall and reflection around the content, around this body of knowledge in our class. And open educational resources offer some advantages to us. For example, students get to keep that PDF or whatever version of the book they use forever. It doesn't disappear at the end of the semester or at the end of their one year long access. And so then if they need to go back for a future course, they still have access to those resources or they're still available online and they can go back and find them where they used them before. And I also think as we think more creatively about our instructional materials, we can, we can reflect on how this learning process and the way our course is structured is working for our students and think about what changes we might want to make or some other, um, trying some new things, which can be fun. So I just want to briefly, briefly talk about something that I'm doing in my Biochemistry 2 class, which um, have any of you heard of this idea of a course-based undergraduate research experience, a cure? So the idea is not everyone's going to have the chance to do research when you're an undergraduate, but if we could bring some research experiences into the classroom, students can get a taste of research without having to take on you know, an extra internship or maybe an, an unpaid um, independent study type course. So I worked to create a module for my Biochemistry 2 class that would incorporate my research, which is around iron uptake <laughs> in insects. So for something to be defined as a cure, there needs to be, um, it needs to be part of a course, right? That's the course-based part. The work needs to be on a real scientific problem. 
um, with the potential to make discoveries that are of interest to the scientific community. So this is not the, maybe the cookbook sorts of labs that we're used to um, sometimes doing in lab classes. And there's going to be an iterative element where students are going to do something, see how it worked, try again, and do some troubleshooting. And then we need to communicate the work back to stakeholders. So I was able to um, share the resources that I developed for this module in my Biochemistry 2 class on a website, and I was able to put a Creative Commons license on them so that other faculty who are interested in using them can use them as a starting place and then iterate. I understand that not everyone is interested in iron uptake in insects, but this could apply to any sort of, we're interested in certain, Oh, yeah, that's fantastic. Totally unexpected that there might be someone else interested in this topic. But honestly, this is, this is molecular biology. This is biochemistry. We could change the proteins that we're looking at and the, the genes that we're starting with and apply it to really all sorts of other projects. And so if someone else wants to do a similar project, they can take my materials as a starting place and then customize it for their own, if they like, because I shared it out under a Creative Commons license. And that's the power of open educational resources. We're using these openly licensed uh, materials to allow this collaboration across, um, across different faculty and across institutions. And what I discovered is there's resources through Science Magazine that people wrote about model organisms, including the fruit fly, Drosophila, which I use for my research, that talk about these biochemistry two concepts that link it to the lecture class that I'm working in. So what I am doing this semester for the first time is I'm using an online annotation tool that's called Hypothesis with this funny dot is at the end. And students, I assign the reading, and the students can highlight it and make comments in the margin. And so I'm giving them a small amount of points for making some comments on the reading. They are actually doing the reading in a way that has not <laughs> happened in previous semesters where I shared these readings with them. And they're bringing their questions to class. I can see their questions in here. It's almost a just-in-time teaching thing where I can read the students' responses, see what they didn't understand well or what questions they have. And when I show up in lecture the next day, I can address those burning questions. This has been so fun for me. And I have a stolid a colleague, Steve Crisman, who's going to share about this uh, during Open Ed Week on Thursday. So we'll have a live streamed event. Uh, so you can check that out or, or read it later. Um, well you can see a student even put like a video in her annotation, like, oh, I found this video really useful. So there's all sorts of cool tools out there. And we can think about how to incorporate them into our classes to get our students to do the things we're hoping they'll do anyway so that we all have more fun. Our students have more fun. They learn more. We have more fun. We feel more satisfied. Um, here's a paper that I was able to put in there and have them annotate the same way. So it's a great, anyway. So there's a lot of cool things out there that we can do. And that's, <laughs> I think that's really what Jonathan and I are trying to share. So, uh, this might seem like kind of an aggressive symbol, but what is in it for me as a faculty member? I love the added agency. I am able to really think about what's important to me to teach, find the resources that support that, and try it in my classroom. And then I can keep iterating, right? It doesn't have to be perfect, but I can keep changing things up, adding some, a new element, and like get, figuring out how to get the students to do the reading. Whoa, <laughs> that's, that's been big. Um, and I like the creativity. So this is just a silly picture that someone helped me make for my online chemistry class. But bringing some creativity back into um, our course development has been really powerful for me. So that's, that's my spiel. We're going to come back and do a little back and forth at the end. But now this is Jonathan's big block of time. So thanks. So Emily is such an empiricist. I don't, that's, um, I'm, I'm a pure mathematician by training, and, and um, in my community, you sort of, someone asked some, like, did that teaching method work? And someone will say, oh, that's just an empirical question, um, with a sort of note of disdain. But I, I think it's wonderful that, that she has done these surveys and found out whether these things actually work. I don't know. I think it's also kind of cool that Emily, I think Emily is much more thoughtful about this. You know, the, the Make It Stick book, I've seen it and, and, and peruse it. It's, Thinking about the ways of doing design and, and thinking about the student learning outcomes from the very beginning, I think, is a really powerful thing, which I have only very, very recently in my long academic career started to do. And so I think she's doing a much more thoughtful 
um, approach. So I'm trying to tell you some of the things that I've done in open education. Many of them were kind of stumbled in, and I didn't even realize at the time that they were open education or that they were open educational resources. But you know, not every educational resource, it, as Emily said already, is, looks exactly like a textbook. So the, a lot of these things are, don't, don't look particularly like textbooks, but they made my experience teaching and I think hopefully my students' experiences more interesting and more fun. So I made a sort of summary of what I've been doing in open education, and I think I sort of went back and looked at a bunch of courses I've been teaching. I think it started about 2012 was the first time I did was something that was clearly open education. Um, and I was taking an advanced class, and um, I'll go through sort of m uh, several of these. I don't, I don't want to go through every single one of these, but I'll go through several of these. And you can see the very, some of them are around textbooks, some of them are around other tools, and I think it's fun to, you know, sort of see the experience and the different approaches um, that, and then sort of somewhere only in the middle that I realized that this was OER. I, I didn't learn any of those terms until sort of the middle of this. But so let me start, so here's, an, here's one for example. So in the spring of 2012, I was assigned to a pretty advanced course. This is a junior or senior level course on my department in number theory. Um, um, I'm terrible at arithmetic, but um, whenever I can't calculate a tip, I say, well, I'm good at numbers in theory, but not in practice. <laughs> um, and uh, so the, the, I was put onto this class like a week before the semester started, and they had, the bookstore had already, al already ordered a book called A Friendly Introduction to Number Three, which is quite friendly. Um, it's a very good book. It's about $180, and I didn't choose it. I was kind of pissed off. I didn't choose it and it was expensive, and I figured this was a very slim little book for $180. And I thought, that's just insane. So what I did was I spun up an instance of MediaWiki. MediaWiki Wiki is the software that runs Wikipedia. And I had, I sort of laid out an outline of a textbook for number theory in a wiki-like wiki thing. And then I told, I signed two students every week to write a chapter. And um, so to make math look pretty on the web, there's a, uh, so mathematicians use a tool called LaTeX, L-A-T-E-X, pronounced LaTeX, and it seems a little intimidating. My colleagues always say, how are you going to have the students learn how to make things look pretty, those, all those formulas and everything? It turns out the students had absolutely, n I not have got a single complaint about learning how to use LaTeX. It's just, you know, you learn a few things, a few little tricks to make the symbols come out, you know, superscripts and subscripts and integral signs and derivative signs. It's not a complicated thing. Students got it instantly. So. I had them, just like editing a Wikipedia page, you just go to this MediaWiki and you start creating context. So MediaWiki is, um, so this is, this is an example of an open educational resource. Open educational resources are the ones which have open licenses on them. So actually the open licenses that are in for textbooks, or as, as Emily mentioned, Creative Commons licenses. I love Creative Commons. I have a Creative Commons tattoo. Um, <laughs> but um, before the Creative Commons came into existence. Well. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so actually, Creative Commons is sort of the second of sort of open movement of its flavor in sort of in modern history. The first one was, people usually call it open source software. I prefer the acronym FLOSS for free, libre, open source software. And um, it's software which is written, and in the same way as an open textbook, it's anyone can modify it, anyone can copy it, you get to see the source code um, as opposed to just having a running version of the program. So there's a lot of software. People think, oh, mo commercial software is what is the r everyone uses, Windows or Mac, all this commercial software. Actually, the internet runs on Floss. Um, all of the main servers run Floss. The Amazon Web Services run Floss. And, you know, Google is run on Floss systems. It's, it's a, the internet runs on this free software. It's a, it's a weird, well-kept secret. Um, anyway, and Wikipedia runs on MediaWiki, which is a bu huge, beautiful, well, um, beautiful piece of software that, that is um, a free software, Floss software. So um, when I started doing this in 2012, it's a little bit complicated to install and run your own instance of this program. It's much easier now. You can point and click and install it on some, on some hosting services. Um, I host all my websites now on this site called reclaimhosting.com. He's got great deals for academics. You buy your own website and the, the name and everything for about $35 <coughs> a year. It's incredibly good. Um, and he, you, he has one point, point and click installation of MediaWiki now. Anyway, so I had the students go, so this is what it looked like. I had a list of all the chapters of this textbook and I told, assigned them to go and you know, click on one of, these, one of these things and, it, and just like in Wikipedia. If you search for something in Wikipedia, it doesn't exist, exist yet. A page comes up, it says, this page doesn't exist yet. Do you want to create it? I don't know if anyone here has edited Wikipedia. Who's edited Wikipedia pages? A few people. Have or have? Have. <laughs> okay. 
four people, I think, four or five. So it's not hard, it's fun. Everyone should edit a Wikipedia page. It's part of being part of the knowledge commons. It's not very hard and it's kind of cool. I got into a huge argument with someone on the page about um, simple random samples of things. And I keep arguing back and keep, he edits my page, I edit his page <laughs> on Wikipedia. So. Um, anyway, uh, so, and this is an example of what, what these things look like. You can see lots of math formulas. As I said, it's not complicated to make the formulas. The students were able to all write this very quickly. You know, I, there was a theorem we talked about in this class and, there was a, and, then, and some explanation. This is kind of student writing, right? It's not good math writing, but we had, an, we'd had discussed you know, how to put mixtures of text and equations and have, so it was a good example for me to help them, case for me to help them learn how to be better writers. So this is an open educational resource. And it's also one, when it's done, actually I kind of let this MediaWiki thing die a couple of year or two after I ran, it was a long time ago, but it was, an, it was a resource that existed for a while and people could use this as a, as a resource for t learning or teaching. Um, Oh, you can see this is a student written page and this is a page I wrote, some notes on prob a problem. And my, my, this looks, even if I, if I take off my glasses and stuck and stand in the back of the room, I can tell a mathematician wrote this and not a student. Because mathematics written by mathematicians has text with a few equations. Students tend to think it's all equations. You know, math has a lot of text in it. Anyway, so and this is what it looks to edit, edit this. This is very similar to editing a Wikipedia page. This is an edit page on Wikipedia, except there are these weird things with these dollar signs. That's to make mathematical symbols. This is what it looks like if you're in kind of hacker mode, which is the where I like to live. Um, what happened? Whoops. Okay. So, um, so uh, working in, in this resource, you know, it, it used a wiki text, so to make things look pretty in Wikipedia, you know, like a, what's a header or what's bold or something. There's some decorations you put on the text when you're editing it that then get converted in, in live Wikipedia to bold or italics or links or things. That's called wiki text and the math is done with LaTeX. Those are both m markup languages. So like everyone knows HTML, HTML stands for hypertext markup language. A markup language is something you're writing which has little decorations that get turned into something else when you look at it through the right program. So learning a skill of learning how to use these. Okay, so then let's see, just another example a couple of years later. Um, we'll come back to number theory in a minute in a slightly different context. Um, so I was teaching a course on intro, sort of basically introduction to programming in the math department, much lower level course. And um, so here's another case of using some free software. So we usually in the past had used this very expensive piece of software called MATLAB. It's nice, lots of engineers use MATLAB. Um, there's a free version of it called Octav. Um, and so I just used, um, uh, I just use so when I taught this class, we didn't use a textbook at all. So I just made a huge web page, and every so I sort of did a just-in-time teaching. So this is another thing you can do. It's open educational resources. Put a Creative Commons license on it, and it's an open educational resource. Made a huge web page, which kind of had the outline of the entire course. And as we got close to each week, I would know what we'd done last week, what we accomplished, what was still a problem people didn't quite understand. I would uh, change what was in the next week's outline content. Lots of links to other pages which had resources students could read about what we're learning, and lots of links to problems they could work on. And they all also did this thing, I wanted them to use free resources. I just think it's a better habit for us to be into. So I had them all take this free operating system called Linux. Um, most people use either Mac or Windows. There's another operating system you can run on your computer. It's called Linux. That's the one that Google and Amazon runs mostly. And um, I had them install it on a thumb drive. And they would come into the computer lab every day to teach the, to where I would t teach the class. They would plug the thumb drive into their computer and reboot the computer off of the thumb drive as if it was the hard drive. So they were using, so I got this reputation, oh, this is a crazy guy who doesn't even want to use Windows on campus. His students come in and they just reject all of that, uh, that commercial software and they use this free software. It's not, it seems a little weird and scary. <laughs> it's, it's open to you, just like open educational resources, these free soft, this free software, you can make it do what you want. You know, Emily had target matched her you know, course goals to the content she provided. The free source, resources, I said, you know, install these six programs on your free little operating system running on your thumb drive. It was customized to what we needed to do in that class. So, okay, then I taught number theory again. Um, and I thought, oh, hey, I've d I had, you know, the, the student writing the textbook, that's kind of fun. And it, but, you know, the, the student versions of the chapters needed a lot of work to be understandable by other students. The learning experience of writing that chapter was pretty good, but the other students didn't have the kind of resource they wanted. So I thought, oh, I'll just collect those things, I'll make my own textbook. Can't be, I've done this a million times, can't be that hard. Turns out it's a lot of work. 
Um, so I wrote this book called, I was calling it yet another introductory number theory textbook. Um, and uh, it covered exactly what I wanted to cover. Um, I wrote it in big chunks. These are what the chunks look like. As you can see, it didn't have, so Emily, she'll talk about it at the beginning, you know, pictures and other ways of learning things. <laughs> don't have a lot of pictures. Um, on the other hand, math books, the expensive commercial math books tend to have like a little biography of Gauss or something, or you know, Euler or something, and little pictures of the history of mathematics. And I asked the students afterwards, you know, did you like that story of Gauss? And like, Who? I, you know, they don't pay zero attention <laughs> to, the, to the extra little stuff on the side. So I didn't put any of that extra stuff in this at all. It's just the stuff, just what I needed in my class. Okay, it was a little bit kind of, I always tried to stay a week ahead of the class writing text. This was a huge amount of work. You know, I got very little sleep that semester. But, you know, it covered exactly what I wanted to. The students had issues. I could have another section on something in the next week. So it's a lot of work, but it's fun. Oh, and the other thing, you may not, I don't know if you can read this, but um, this is my name. This is, I, I got an open educational resource on the net, and I chose there was only one OER for number theory that for which the LaTeX source code was distributed for free. So uh, this guy named Wissam Raj, Raji, he's at the American University in Cairo. And so I just used his, I thought I was going to use it a lot, I was going to modify his text. It turned out I ended up mostly writing it myself. But um, that's the kind of thing you would do if you share, if people share their OER. You can, now, now people can, sh I've shared mine so people can share this. So that seemed, whoops, this is what it looked like when, so, this is what it looks like to, to make the pretty text. Th this, this comes from that, um, which seems annoying, but it, it's a markup language, right? You know, I want the title to be readings for a CSUP 319 spring 2019. So they say it's backslash title. Right? It's not that hard to learn these little codes. So, um, and then, uh, then the next year I thought, I'll do it again. And I'm teaching the same course again. Actually, notice the course got demoted. It was a 419, now it's only a 319. But, I thought, I have all this resource, all I'll do is make it a little prettier. It turns out it's a lot of work to make a second edition of a book as well as a first edition. <laughs> so this took a lot of time as well, but it does exactly, I thought this time when I teach it, number theory is used a lot in the modern world for cryptography, cryptology, the, in, you know, you can use your credit card on the internet. You guys were talking about cryptocurrencies, you know, you can use Bitcoin, all this stuff is based on number theory. So I thought I'll make a version of my textbook which talks a lot about cryptology. So I made the cryptology emphasis version and I wrapped it all up into one, Thing. I felt a little more comfortable this semester because I wasn't just staying a week ahead in front of the class. So this is the kind of thing you can do. It takes a lot of time, um, but it does exactly what you want it to do. It covers exactly what you want to cover and exactly the perspective you want. So um, this is what it looks like. So I did have some pictures in this version. This was about, this was, um, de I, this is decrypt, I, I encrypted a piece of Hamlet. And then I decrypted, ha I taught the students how to decrypt Hamlet in this encrypted version of Hamlet. So that was, that's the kind of thing the textbook has. And this looks, you know, it looks uh, semi-professional, but it's pretty easy if you're good with these tools to make these kinds of things. So when you did the decryption, yeah. did it tell you that it was written by a monkey? <laughs> 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 no. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm going to skip this one. There's another one. Um, okay, then the next, the other OER, another OER I've written is, I was teaching STAT. So, Statistics, so this is, by this time I knew the word OER, I knew something about Creative Commons licensing, more, more, much more about Creative Commons and licensing. And I was outraged that my students had to spend a lot of money. We, have, we used a very good statistics textbook, it's a fine book, I have nothing against it. But it has all of those biographies of famous statisticians that students don't pay attention to. It has a glossy, beautiful hardcover. And some of these things students care. Um, I just wanted just what I'm going to cover and I want it to be free, so I found Again, I found an open textbook on the Open Textbook Library, which is a great resource if you're not familiar with it. I found a great, a pretty good textbook. It wasn't exactly what I wanted. You know, I'd been teaching before out of this textbook that has a certain order of the materials and the, the content of the course. And this free one was very nice and adaptable, but it didn't, it didn't cover exactly this. So I, I took this free one and I shuffled the things to be in the order I preferred. And I tinkered with it a lot and I ended up with this free resource. Um, okay, that was... I ended up, again, this was like the first time I did number theory. The, cor the course was okay. Um, I had a weird, so here's a talking about looking at actual real live data. I had a weirdly live, I had two sections. I took a purely online version and an in-person version of the same course, of the same resource. Um, this was maybe the first time I ever taught online. And I had a weirdly low success rate in my online course. 
And I don't know if that's because I was just learning or be one of the reasons I was thinking is perhaps people, um, a lot of people sign up for a course and then maybe drop out before they officially appear on your register. If the, if the resource if is free, there's less financial barrier to sort of sticking it with the class. So it's conceivable that switching to free resources decreased my overall success rate because people were intended, were you know, made more incentive to stay in the class because it was not costing them as much as it might have been. Right. That's one hypothesis. Let's see, I'm not going to talk about that one. Um, so then I went back to, a year later, I went back to the statistics. Um, and I, again, did the same thing I did with my number three. I wrapped it up in a very pretty package. I call, I give called lies, damn lies of statistics. The reason, that's a, Tom, Mark Twain apparently said there are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. Um, uh, and um, this still, I thought this would be super easy. It still turns out to be a lot of work to get these things. Um, I should mention, I had pretty covers of the number three book and of this one, the reason I, ma I made a pretty cover um, because you can, uh, exactly as Emily was saying, you, some students prefer the hard copy, right? So how are you going to make it available in a hard copy? Well, you could print it. Students have a certain number of pages they can get for free from the campus printing. Um, there's also color, you know, color images in some of these. That seems like it's very expensive. So what I did was I uploaded it to some on print-on-demand services. This one I uploaded to Amazon. It's quite expensive. This is how Jeff Bezos got to be the richest man in the world. It's like $29 is the cheapest I could set the price on it. My number theory textbook is $7.99. It's available through lulu.com. I make 60 cents of profit every time someone bought some buys, they spend seven, that was the lowest price I was allowed to set it for. And I say in the introduction, if you bought it from Lulu, I'll give you, you know, call me, I'll give you your 60 cents back. I don't want to make, um, and uh, okay. So let me say something briefly about press books. So lies, damn lies, or statistics, L L D L O S. So press books is a platform, I don't know, do you guys have press books on your campus? It's so so um, Pressbooks is this platform for authoring books. It was originally, so it's based on WordPress, which is um, a website, so, you know, some huge fraction of the world's internet sites are on wor WordPress, something insane like 30% or something, just a really huge amount. Um, it's a tool that makes authoring websites easier. Some years ago, some people took WordPress and sort of adapted it for really, for people who want to write books, you know, romance novels, that people who want to write books. Um, it's an ad, it's a, what are they called? Theme, it's a theme on top of WordPress multi-site to make, to, to make book, textbook, uh, book authoring easier. And then the Pressbooks people saw the OER world really liked this. So this is an authoring tool. It's a sort of WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get kind of, kind of interface, and um, we use Pressbooks now on my campus, and we have, a, and it's a really comfortable environment. You can cut and paste things out of Word. I don't use Word, because I don't use that damn commercial software, but you know, you can, it's pretty easy. It knows LaTeX, so it can do nice math, math equations, um, and it's a, it's a much more easy, easy, friendly user interface. So um, I've been porting this book over to Pressbooks recently. So uh, I think we're done here. Oh, so I don't want to say any other, so these are the ranges, so I just want to say, so I'm, I have less, less kind of connection with pedagogical goals, and I think that Emily is a much better teacher than I am, but I, you know, I kind of stumble into these things, and I think it, it just sort of shows, so, you know, it shows, you know, if you don't want people controlling your classroom, if you want, you know, like, the reason I had the students plug in the thumb drive and reboot, because I don't like someone else telling me how to run my class, right? I want the software I want, I don't even want to have to go to the IT department on my campus and say, install this software on all the lab computers. I want them on the thumb drive, plug the damn thing in, and then you've got the right software. So if you're a little bit more egotistical about your class and you really want to control it, you know, go with the free stuff. It's open, it's modifiable, you get to do it, and there are lots and lots of things. Software is the open, the resources themselves can be modified, some of them interactive, as Emily has shown us. And I think this is just a great way to give you more freedom. There's also some language instruction here. The, a colleague of mine on my campus does a huge amount, that she has the kind of students co-authoring a textbook, she they have them writing, um, like she's, has them writing um, in Spanish textbooks, it's a kind of an upper level Spanish class, and she has them writing s chapters about topics that they've researched and then practicing writing in Spanish in that way. So the, these kind of build it yourself, if you just don't want anyone else telling you what to do, the build it yourself <laughs> approach kind of gets you into the open educational world. So we're gonna connect together and wrap up with some of the statewide stuff. Yeah, so Dustin already shared that the whole reason the three of us know each other is because of the Colorado State OER Council. 
And this has really, I think, been helpful because the state legislature put some money towards this, so our institutions have been able to apply to get some grant funding. Um, it's helping us raise awareness, get people interested in these opportunities. So I just want to share what serving on the state OER council has helped me realize. And we haven't talked about it a lot today, but there is a huge impact on the cost of materials on student achievement. And I know Jonathan was like speculating about what happened in that one online section, but there, there was just a great meta-analysis done by Virginia Clifton that shows, is it Clifton or Clinton? Oh dear, okay, so yeah. sorry it's I didn't Clinton. put her it's name Clinton. on. It's Clinton. Clinton. Yeah. Okay, so they, they, she analyzed um, dozens of surveys that include like over 100,000 students or studies that looked at open educational resources versus traditional materials. And there was a statistically significant decrease in the drop rates in the courses. Um, so increased retention. So I guess that's actually consistent with what you saw. There's also some, yeah, so increased retention <laughs> among these courses. But to, to be really be retained, like hopefully you're, you're passing the course. And the way I always sell the, the, that study as well is that if you look at, the, the, they teased out, um, or maybe one of the studies that's in that meta study looked at, asked students, um, Pell eligible minority identified students, and it turns out that the reduction in um, dropout rate is three times higher. You get three times more benefit um, in terms of retention in Pell eligible and some minority identified students. So yes. on my campus, we're a majority minority institution. That's most of our students, right? So we can get a much larger impact with switching. Yes, that. so this study was out of the University of Georgia and other Georgia institutions. The last name was Colvard, and they showed um, increases in success in courses that had been switched over to OER as well as a decrease in a drop rate. And that was a great study. So, but there's also just students being able to access the materials, students being able to use the materials, having a level playing field for all of our students. Um, I've also found the importance of building relationships and teams. I had never really worked with librarians <laughs> a whole lot before. And <laughs> librarians are fantastic about helping us find resources, which you start to care more about when you're doing these innovative things. So I apologize to my librarian colleagues for not appreciating you prior, but <laughs> librarians, and then also the cool role that instructional designers can play and helping us think about how we're teaching our classes. Um, and it's also really lovely when the administrations of our university are supportive of our innovative projects. And I think having a statewide initiative has helped build some of that. And I see that as a positive. Uh, so my, if I want to find some generalization, I guess I would say, um, so I guess a little bit of comfort with level with the technology is helpful. I mean, I, you know, I, I suppose when I was, I wrote, we, we gave a version of this talk a while ago and I was pushing harder on the technology. I think the modern, some of the tools are getting better and better. Pressbooks is a really, con you know, really convenient um, tool that uh, some colleagues of mine have written a, a resource we're using on campus. They have very little comfort level and um, enjoyment of technology, so maybe that's less and less of an, an issue. I guess another thing I find um, I've learned in this whole process is that a certain kind of obstinacy, monomania about, you know, damn it, I'm going to do it my way. You know, that seems kind of, that can be really annoying in a colleague, or, or the colleague can do something cool with it, right? And so try to be the cool colleague who has that monomania, monomania I think, is a, um, and I like to lean hard on, you know, academic freedom is something we love to talk about in the academy, um, and, you know, if you look at the definition of academic freedom, from the, it was defined by the AUP in about 1915, and then it was sort of stated very beautifully in the 1940 statement, and it says, institutions of education are conducted for the common good, and not to further the interest of either the individual teacher or the institution as a whole. The common good depends upon free search for truth and its free exposition. So I think this is kind of cool. You know, we get academic freedom, not because we won some really great bargaining deal 100 years ago, and we're just lucky. We get it because we think it matters. So, you know, the person who's really just an annoying colleague because they're, they're really obstinate and an iconoclast, that maybe they're not helping. They're, they say, oh, academic freedom lets me do whatever I want. The answer is no, it doesn't. It allows you to do whatever you want if you're serving the common good. And OER and open educational tech approaches to teaching as a way to sort of be an iconoclast and serve the common good at the same time. Um, so at, if you're a faculty member thinking about when it, what's in it for you, I would say find your intrinsic motivation, right? What's, why did you become a teacher in the first place? Like what, where are you energized? And tap into that. Find ways to engage your students. And I think we can reconnect to the joy of teaching through this. And that if, if we do that, that's going to make OER sustainable for us. 
Um, and then I think it's helpful for us to look for opportunities to share stories. So I did something crazy, and I gave a TED Talk at the MSU Denver TEDx event because I wanted to share stories about open educational resources. So that's kind of a crazy example because that's way stressful. And I'm not <laughs> saying I know. It's also awesome. So if you get the chance, yes. And But I think it's helpful for us to share what we're doing in our classrooms that's working well and share it with colleagues, whether it's just at conferences or either just informally on campus, and that way we can have models for um, cool things that we can do together. Oh, and I guess I would say, yeah, so I'm back on being iconoclast, but also, you know, um, I think we need to, you know, uh, it's easy to get stuck in a rut. We were having a conversation in the coffee shop before we came. It's easier to, you know, you give me a piece of chalk and tell me to talk about statistics, I will talk for a semester unless you shut me up, right? So, you know, it's easy for us to get stuck. We know how to do things. It's, but, you know, we make our students get out of their comfort zone all the time. So we should be willing to get out of our comfort zone sometimes, too. And learning some of these new approaches and the, how to use these new tools is something we should be willing to. I think it makes us better teachers to be aware of what it's like not to know something. And um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good practice for us to get. And, you know, learning these tools. And the tools are getting better and better. So there are high-quality tools that will make a lot of these things much easier to use. So that's all from us, but thank you so much for your attention. We really appreciate you coming. Before we move to, before we move to questions, because some people will need to filter out, I want to say a couple things. These two brought up how much work it was far too many times. <laughs> um, what I really want to say is it, is, it is so much easier in 2020 than it was in 2015 and 2012. And talk to some of your colleagues. If this is something you're interested in, there are resources on this campus that can help you. And there is a lot of ways to mitigate the amount of work it is, especially to get started with open educational resources. Yes, you might advance to a place where you're going to get a group together, you're going to build this incredible resource, and you're going to do something that changes lives, not just here, but all over the country and the world. That's not usually where you start. And um, Jonathan is kind of the exact opposite of where most people start. Jonathan was just like, I'm going to build this shit, and I'm going to do it my way. Because that's who Jonathan is, and that's amazing. We can get you started in a much simpler fashion to help you and your students. And I just wanted to. So there's also a thing, you know, if you use a commercial textbook, the new edition comes out, right? You can, your bookstore won't order the old edition for more than about a year, right? So they forced you to redesign your course on their schedule. If you use an open educational resource, you, use it, you redesign it whenever you want. The so don't write a new textbook right now, but the next time they come to a new edition, take the time, instead of redesigning for the next edition, redesign to use an open and resource. And here's my last plug. There's a lot of existing resources out there that yeah. faculty have created. There's no big PR or marketing firm behind them. So you just have to know to go look for them, right? And because no one's pouring a lot of money powers. into raising your awareness of them. But they're out there. And that's what the librarians are here to help us do, is to help find these existing resources. So the Open Textbook Library is a great place to start for finding whole, complete textbooks. And then if you're wanting to go down the rabbit holes of individual pieces that you're weaving together, that's a, you know, especially where the librarians help us navigate these um, search tools. Oh, the library. It's run by the University of Minnesota, but it's just open textbook. Well, it's open dot. Yeah, open dot um dot edu. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. open dot u n m n u m n because it's University of Minnesota, so u m n. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, I can send it to you as well so that you have it. Yeah. And I will thank you all for being here. And any questions you have, go ahead and ask Jonathan and Emily. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, thank thanks you. Thank you. Appreciate you having us.